Good morning, expert, expert panel members, student presenters, and honored attendees. Welcome to Vernon D, the first morning section. My name is Jose Butt, and I will be serving as faculty moderator for this section. Um, before we begin, I would like to announce that today's section is being live broadcast. Please remember to turn off your cell phone, uh, not turn off the cell phone, but just uh, make it in uh, quiet mode, all right? Uh, there will be three student presenters today. Each one will deliver a 15 minute presentation and followed with five minute Q&A section. It is my job to ensure everyone should be on time. So please don't mind if I stop you. At the end of the section, I will call upon all the students and industry panel members to take a group photo. It is my pleasure to begin our introduction to you to our four expert panel members. The first one, Ms. Kara Fegarido, Architect of Cultural Heritage Department from Cultural Affairs Bureau. Welcome. Second, Ms. Nancy Ng, Director and Primary of HR Department, Wen Macau. Our third, Expert panel member, Mr. Orson Wong, Council Chairman from Macau Cultural Heritage Association. Our last expert panel member, Ms. Amanda Wang, Executive Macau, from Macau Government Tourism Office. All right, our first presenter this morning is Echo Hung. Please begin your presentation. So, um, dear attendees, thanks for coming today. And I am Echo, and I'm very honored to present here about my research, the conservation of classified immovable properties in Macau, the case study of Houston Lukak. So I'll present within four sections. Uh, there are introduction, methodology, findings and discussions, and conclusion. So firstly, maybe you'll be curious about the definition of classified immovable property, CIP. It refers to the uh, property that has the cultural relevance. It is classified by Macau Cultural Heritage Protection Law uh, in 1984 by forming lists. So currently some of the CIPs are facing challenges. And my research is based on the arguments for uh, the uh, case of Hustalong Bukak. It was a CIP unleashed in 1989 under the category of building of architectural interest. Actually, it was a private owned three floor tea house and it operated from uh, 1930s to 1980s. It was located uh, in the uh, to, uh, in the uh, the uh, the Cinco de Otoplu and Avenida de Ahmed Habelu. Um, the reasons why that I want to explore this uh, property is that it experienced uh, three stages when it, it was firstly operated since 1920s to 1980s, and then it experienced uh, as, as least as a CIP and later closed down in 1919 and stayed vacant to 2017 and experienced a depolition. And then since 2017, as facade was torn down, um, actually it went from uh, complete conditions to the current conditions there where only nine pillars were left uh, without any preservation or maintenance actions. And this was the problem. Um, this was the brief description uh, kept from the governmental website. Um, 
the description was quite simple. It said that constructed in 1940s, um, the constructed currently uh, the collapse and the uh, walls uh, and the only feature uh, remain standing today. So actually this description was quite uh, simple and it requires updates. There is no a value statement or detailed historical research. Moreover, uh, for its future, a management plan is also lacked. Therefore, I uh, asked about two research questions. What is Hudson Lukak as a heritage place? And what is its cultural significance? Then considering the cultural significance in the current state of repair, what is best intervention methods to preserve it? So let's move to the literature review part. So um, I want to firstly identify the purpose of conservation. It will help to conserve material and retain and maintain or even shape the values embodied by the heritage. Therefore, the value-based approach is quite useful. Um, actually, it can help to ensure that decisions are made in a logical way and even involve the key players or form allies to benefit the site. Uh, this approach can be simplified uh, within uh, the decision-making process who has the name of Burra Charter Process. And the first stage is to understand the significance uh, by writing the statement of significance. Um, I want to stress the concept of character defining elements, which is CDEs, because it will help to distinguish both the tangible and intangible uh, elements uh, that embody the heritage values. And it is quite helpful for the future interventions the second stage is develop policy and you will identify the appropriate intervention methods. And the last one is to manage accordance with the policy. Um, regarding the uh, methods, the intervention methods, uh, the reconstruction actually uh, went through many controversies um, in the 19th century. However, at this moment, it is not as strongly discouraged as it once was. Um, Actually, it means to return a place to a non-earlier state by removing accretions or by reassembling existing elements with the introduction of some new types of material. However, it did have some limited conditions, like uh, the construction itself should stand for a national uh, identity, and uh, the old structure may be destroyed in the uh, exceptional circumstances like some Dutch uh, natural disaster or armed conflicts and so on. And moreover, the new structure should be based on sound documentation and so on. So um, then let's move to the methodology part. I applied the qualitative study in this case, and I also utilized the case study and collect the data by semi-structure interviews and documentation research. Um, six respondents um, among the conservationists or the governance are selected and they earned the experience in the heritage industry of Macau, ranging from seven to 20 years. And they all understood the case well. Uh, by uh, the documentation research, I uh, will find out the archives like photos, maps, drawings, and some governmental documents. So after uh, applying this math methodologies and the above theories, I will move to the findings. So um, as the first stage of for a charter process is to understand the significance, three types of values are identified, aesthetic values, social values, and historic values. Um, actually, the social values and historic values were referred to the values in the past because um, it's drinking tea atmosphere and its functions are no longer uh, here now. So they did not retain anymore after the close down of the uh, restaurant in 1919. So I will illustrate the CDEs of the aesthetic uh, of these values. Um, the aesthetic values laid in four categories. And the first two are stylish facade and uh, setting and layout. So we can see that um, the facade was of stylish facade stylish and is of eclecticism and neoclassic style. And this was uh, ascertained by the respondent of governor. However, uh, other respondents may thought that this was not the key of its heritage classification. Um, they valued the next three categories high. Um, 
uh, the CD that I mentioned about CDs of the setting and layout, it is all of link nine design. And we can see that it had a six meter ceilings that created a visual ground atmosphere and the classical carriage seats, the long and stable stairs that face directly to the entrance. And also it has a quite flexible uh, structure because the walls will support its own mass only. And then the next two categories are the interior display and decorative elements. Its CDEs uh, could be seen from uh, its advertisement and signage that hung high. And also it had the displays of paintings, calligraphy, works and mirrors to create an elegant atmosphere. And all the types of uh, CDEs that we could see as is uh, excellent mature windows, partitions with decorate motifs. And also the most special one is pyramid vaulted ceilings with decorated friezes. They are quite uh, rarely found in Macau. So uh, they were outstanding. So mentioning about the current situation, um, all of the respondents agree with the, uh, the remaining pillars had have the neoclassical style and aren't deco style. However, there are conflicts about the, the belonging of the value. Uh, from the government part, they thought that the value contributes to the uh, values of the property itself, while others may, uh, the respondents from the public sector will regard the uh, value only contribute to the public street of uh, uh, that site. So regard, let's move to the social values. It will refer to as functions of uh, entertainment and communication. Therefore, as CDEs are uh, intangible, it will create the it will relate to the elegant and relaxing atmosphere, and also as functions like the social gatherings and the uh, performance that are here. The last one is historic values, and it was related to the historic person who was its founder, twenty nine. Um, actually, it had made a huge contribution to the tea house industry and during the Republic of China era, uh, it opened up to 20 tea houses during this time. Um, actually, it broke the boundaries among the restaurants and tea houses. The, he combined the characteristics together so that a night tea is, uh, uh, it was also invented. The next findings uh, is the, about the uh, the intervention methods, it will focus on the reconstruction and redevelopment. However, at this moment, the restaurant Lococ did not actually meet the, any specific conditions for reconstruction mentioned in the literature review part. Actually, it should, be, uh, it should not be reconstruction uh, according to the international guideline. So this finding suggests that reconstruction as a method to conserve heritage is widely acceptable in Macau. So, uh, actually, these two methods are mutually uh, exclusive. Uh, only one can be chosen. So if the stakeholder, stakeholder choose reconstruction, they need to follow the requirements of reconstructed CDEs, involve the professionals, be required to uh, conserve the heritage when they are accomplished. And if the stakeholders choose to rede redevelop the site, um, an illustration of the demolition of the site, and also a report of the, uh, the parallelation of duties, why this site failure to preserve the uh, former property should be also provided. And the commemorative space to memorize the lost heritage the values should also be provided. So all of them should also provide a clear statement. Then regarding its future res uh, uses as it is a uh, uh, private owned uh, tea house, its future uses could not be restricted by the laws. Uh, however, I would consider that the workshop uh, of calligraphy tea aren't handing some that are related to the Macau people's lifestyle and, uh, and it will also contribute to um, the, its custom to spread the custom and happened here previously. So lastly, uh, mentioned about the challenge during the process, we found out whether the Hustle Lokash should still be recognized as CIP when there are only as uh, pillars remained. So three factors are considered. So firstly is the legal regulations. There are no, no uh, 
currently no legal laws have already mentioned about how to uh, abandon the procedure of abandoning one CIP. And also uh, the second factor is about the fairness of preserving heritage. So, so once uh, if this CIP is no longer a CIP, the owner do not need to bear the responsibilities or uh, duties anymore. So maybe it's a bit unfair for all the private owner who uh, bear the responsibilities to, to uh, preserve their own heritage. And lastly, it's mentioned about the challenge of similar conditions. So uh, if once uh, the, the CIP is uh, abandoned, the other private owner may take it as a reference and um, so that they, they may indulge the conditions of their heritage of going back. So all of the respondents agree to not abandon this recognition. So let's move to the conclusion part. So firstly, this um, research helped to document the values. And he also mentioned about the management part to offer some directions about the intervention method to, for the stakeholders to choose. Then he also mentioned about how to interpret the remaining pillars uh, when it has the, it, it will show represent the development and history of the Macau advertising. So thirdly, I want to mention about this future researches. I hope that this research can be the basis for uh, the future one, uh, because the, the findings will suggest that the ways of assessing values from the public, uh, from the professionals is a bit different from the government who categorize the uh, values before previously. So uh, it should be also confirmed by other cases. The mentioning about the legal measures uh, the effectiveness of the communication process uh, is also worthwhile to explore because uh, uh, in this specific case to see why this site failed to preserve in the past. And lastly, it was the limitation as this site was mostly destroyed. The site visit that uh, concerns about its extended um, structure is inapplicable and then as the owner declined the interview, the perspective of the owner is also lacked and it was a pity. So that's all of my presentation. Thanks for listening. For your wonderful presentation. And now I would like to ask our uh, expert panel members if you do have any questions for asking. Congratulations, Echo. Uh, you chose a really um, a very um, substantial topic uh, that shows your concern about a situation that was developed in an unfortunate way. Uh, this um, heritage was neglected for a long time. It was abandoned as a business in the 1990s. And then it ended up being destroyed because the, the structure could not withstand uh, being abandoned for so long. Uh, the owner declined the interview. Uh, this is also um, a matter that is still possibly being still analyzed uh, also by the government and the, the responsibilities of the owner or not. Uh, but uh, um, you showed a great deal of uh, um, comprehensive uh, approach to the case. You, you uh, checked the uh, literature, the Bura chapter, uh, charter, also um, uh, other literature such, such as Joka Yetos. Uh, the expert of UNESCO, of Icomos, that uh, also wrote about how to, uh, the benefits of reconstructing or not. So this ponderation is very well approached in your, in your study. And uh, um, I think that it's, it's now a matter of personal um, opinions from the people who have connection to the building. Uh, the community memory that you mentioned uh, shows that you are considering the immovable heritage also connected to the movable objects that were part of the building, yeah. such as the partitions, the chairs, the staircase, uh, all those elements are very well mentioned. So that, that is the substance that gives um, uh, personality to, to the building also, and the memory of the building. And also you mentioned something about the community, about the intangible aspects, the environment that this building used to have in the past. Can it be recreated in a reconstruction project or not? So I think your approach is very, uh, very much uh, sh shows that you really connected with the building and you did a very scientific approach, but also very, uh, very professional, very, very step by step with all the elements. Um, 
now about the future, we, we have to wait because it's a very recent case. I'm also happy that you are choosing a, an ongoing situation, calling the attention of the city and government officials to the uh, attention that this building deserves. Uh, and let's see how, how the things go. Uh, I cannot advance more because it's an ongoing in the department where I work. Oh. Uh, but I'm very happy that you chose um, this subject because it's uh, an example uh, of what uh, can happen when things go neglected, that properties get uh, demolished, and what can be um, considered for their solution. Uh, nearby the Lococ uh, restaurant, the old Lococ restaurant, um, in the Almeida Ribeiro Avenue, there is also another more positive example, but similar. Uh, was also a private property, the uh, taxing on a pawn shop, mm -hmm. uh, which served as a pilot project, it was also private property. Our department at the time had the opportunity to approach the owner in a, a, a timely manner. And we motivated the owner who took the initiative to make a protocol with us that we could, uh, um, we, we supported the budget for the uh, rehabilitation and the restoration of the building uh, to maintain the taxing on pawn shop uh, museum part, and he would develop the remaining of the building as a, a private uh, a traditional shop uh, initiative. So a very good collaboration that could be could have been the example, uh, the turnout for Lococ, but wasn't. Mm -hmm. So we need to also compare. Thank you for allowing me the extra time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think this is a very interesting topic because um, we this is not only one case in Macau. I observe that there's a many kind of similar case in Macau also have the same problems. Um, most of due to because the buildings belongs to the private properties. So actually um, due to the um, law of the restriction of, you know, classifiers, once it's classified as a immovable properties, so the owners cannot do anything. And also because of the funding problems, I think so, most of the owners, they don't have quite of resources. I mean, to especially depends on the, the buildings, the size of the buildings, maybe they do not have funding for construction, I mean, uh, for renovation or some kind of that. So um, I have one uh, question, but not to the student, but would like to pose to um, Kara. Um, just want to ask uh, about um, if this is the, since you know about um, similar case, there's a many case in Macau similar to this one, Lukok, and also you mentioned others. Is there any, um, you know, um, ideas or, Anything that you think the government can do before the building was collapsed? Is there any step? I mean, the government should do it in a once. Exactly. Very yeah. Uh, it's, uh, very <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> no, no, yeah, it, it's, it depends on the opportunity to approach the owners and the temperament of the owners themselves to allow that approach. Uh, because it has to be an informal uh, meeting of interests with the owner to try to convince them, to motivate them to maybe enter into a partnership in case they don't have funding of their own to make the rehabilitation or, or adopt a different strategy for the future of the buildings instead of allowing them to decay and uh, ultimately collapse so they can collect the insurance values and things like that. So it's a, a question of opportunity. But also in terms of human resources, it's difficult to go to every single case because these are so many um, uh, private uh, enterprises, small enterprises, and we have to respect the private property. But these are all very uh, up-to-date uh, um, situations and subjects that ECHO really uh, brought to attention with this case study. It's uh, congratulations, ECHO. I'm very well impressed with your work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. Arch. Uh, I think we, we should have a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. So now I would like I would like to invite the second speaker, Fisher Fu, for his presentation.
morning, ladies and hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fu Fanshuan, and uh, today I'm going to present my thesis named as Identifying Beliefs Underlying Young Visitors' Interaction with Multimedia Information Panels in Macau Museum, an application of the theory of planned behavior. Uh, I believe all of you can recognize this place. Macau is a tourism city for a very long time, and it's not only famous for its luxury hotels and casinos, but also for its rich um, cultural resources and heritage. So uh, tourism attractions like this are used to always crowded with many people. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19, there are less people nowadays, but uh, it's more common like this in the last years. So with so many visitors come to Macau, they brought uh, many good impact sets like, like the economic boost and providing jobs, but also they brought negative impacts like uh, there are so many people, they brought congestion problems, there are vandalism and uh, many others, you name it. So how can we, how can the site managers to address these issues? There's a concept called visitor management. Visitor management can be defined as all management methods that control visitors' movement and behavior in an attraction. So applying visitor management, there are two benefits. First, it can enhance the quality of service. The visitors can be provided with good uh, visitor experiences. And second, the visitor-related impacts can be managed by the site managers by uh, utilizing visitor management. And uh, so where can we apply these kind of concepts? The answer is all visitor attractions like theme parks, protected natural areas, zoos, and of course, cultural heritage sites, which my city is focusing on. To achieve the two benefits I've mentioned before, there are various kinds of visitor management tools to utilize. So in general, they can be divided into two groups. The first is hard measures, including pricing, zoning, regulations. They are pretty strict and they can control the visitors very well, but somehow they may impair the visitor experience. So there are the soft measures, including marketing, education, and interpret interpretation, which can influence the visitor behavior more subtly and uh, providing the good visitor experience. And the soft measures are the points I'm looking at in my thesis. So there are so many kinds of places, attractions to manage and so many kinds of tools. How can site manage managers to choose and assess or improve their visitor management uh, means and how they can assess it? So, Let's look at into a more specific area I'm focusing on, the use of interactive devices in museum. So museum can be defined as the public institution set for education, enjoyment, and study for the protection and the interpretation of intangible and tangible heritage. So of course they need visitors. No visitors, the education, no purpose of museum cannot be fulfilled. But however, uh, museums, especially the history museum, sometimes the younger generation treats them as a relative boring or unattractive places. So it's common that museums nowadays are using interactive elements like hands-on exhibits, audio guides, and multimedia information panels uh, to provide the younger generations with more interest and uh, experience for them to visit the museum. So here, multi-panel information, multimedia information panels are what I am looking at. This is Macau Museum. It's the museum in Macau that conveys the uh, knowledge of local history, and it is located in the center of the historic city of Macau. And of course, it is utilized the uh, interactive information panels, like the one on the right side is taken from a recent exhibition. So. Is this kind of in interactive devices useful to attract the uh, younger generation? From my own observation and some literature, it's, it's yes, but also no. Like the one on the left, there are some 
panels that are constantly used by the younger generation visitors. And also on the right side, there are some panels. Uh, people just walk there and look at it uh, and they just leave or they interact for some seconds and they also leave and others just, just totally ignore it. There are people, some, some people actively use it and some people passive or just no, not use it. So why this happens? Why people's action are like this? How can we improve this kind of situation? Next, I'm going to introduce a theory called the theory of plant behavior, the TPB. Uh, it's a psychology theory that's been applied in many disciplines, uh, including tourism. It looks like a little bit complicated, but I will explain. At the right hand side, it's the behavior. It means the actual behavior that people perform. To perform a behavior, it needs the intention uh, meaning that you are willing to perform this behavior. And to have the intention, you have to have the attitude, the subjective norm and perceived control. So I'm going to explain these three factors. First one, attitude, do I like it? Do the people want to assess the outcome of the behavior? If the, the outcome is good or not or bad, subjective norm, it's more like the social pressure or the peer pressure from other people, how the other people think will influence how the people will perform the behavior or not. And the perceived control, can the people do it? How he think he or she think he have the right ability or skill to perform the behavior. So to have these three factors, they have their perspective, ascendant factors that's called behavior belief, normative belief and control belief. These three beliefs are the people think or believe about this behavior. So in my thesis where I'm looking at these three beliefs and I think they can be utilized in visitor management. So TBB can be used to explain, first explain the behavior. By exploring the beliefs, you can know how the people, the visitors here, think about their behaviors, why they action like this. And the second, by not only explaining it, you can achieve behavior change. Uh, after finding out all the beliefs, you can compare them, uh, you can measure them, you can find the more important ones. And targeting at the more important ones, you can maybe alter them and uh, make the final behavior of the visitors towards the vi site management goals you need. So here I have two research questions. The first one is, what beliefs do the young visitors have about their interaction with the multimedia information panels in Macau Museum? Which means I'm going to find out their beliefs. And second, how do these beliefs influence their interaction in the museum? So I will go into measure and then compare them to find out the beliefs that have more potential to be influenced to alter the actions. For the methodology I use, there are, it's very clear there are two steps. The first is called belief elicitation, means to find out beliefs. And the second is belief measurement. You find out which beliefs are more important to measure and compare them. For the first step, it's more like a qualitative research. I conduct semi-structured interview, which has three parts of open-ended questions with the young visitors and to Macau Museum, I visit them, I ask them this question at the exit of the Macau Museum. And the, for the behavioral belief, I ask about their view on the positive and negative outcomes of the interaction. For the normative belief, it's about who they think will approve or support or disapprove their interaction. For the control beliefs, it's about uh, what they think are the difficulty or the ease will make them difficult or easy to interaction. So with about asking 14 visitors, I have reached a, a saturation, which means there's no new answers. And I combine all the answers into 11 beliefs. They can be divided into five behavioral beliefs, three normative beliefs and three control beliefs. 
And it's aligned with the studies done before that the behavioral beliefs are most important ones. For the behavioral beliefs, most people think they can have, uh, they can learn more knowledge in the interactions. They, and others think they can feel interesting and entertained by interaction. Some say that, that they can prolong their visit time. And others think uh, the interaction will distract their attention to from the other exhibits. Also, some people think inter interaction may cause hygiene problems. This can be explained by the COVID time. They are reluctant to do the physical interaction. For normative, normative beliefs, most people think their companions, including friends and uh, families will encourage or disencourage maybe their friends want to leave sooner. And uh, museum staff and other visitors may also influence their behavior. For control beliefs, most people think the user friendliness of the interactive system are the most important to decide whether to do or not interact. And uh, the location of the panel, which means the installation place, whether it is easy to spot or approach. And uh, whether the instruction of the panel was provided will decide their final behavior. For the second part, the belief measurement, it's a quantitative part. I conduct structured questionnaires with 148 uh, visitors at the exit of Macomb Museum with a fairly equal number of compliers and non-compliers, means the compliers are the active users interactive interactive with the panels and non compliers are those who didn't actively interact with those passively interact. So for each belief, there are two questions. The first question is about the belief strengths, ask whether the belief is true or not for them. And the second question is about the scale value, um, whether the outcome is good or bad. So the first question is, is range from zero to six and the second is from negative three to three. The final outcome is multiplied. So the uh, number will be negative 18 to 18. If it is higher, it will contribute more to the behavior. If it is lower, it will contribute less to the behavior. So for the belief measurement, the most important one is <clears throat> they think I will, <coughs> sorry, I will learn, <coughs> I will learn more and I will feel interested in the entertainment. So this one too must pay more attention when designing the panels in Macomb Museum. And uh, this one too also ha have the significant differences between the compliers and non-compliers. So they <clears throat> this too can be definitely improved. And for the normative beliefs, most people think my companions are the most influential factors. And for other visitors and museum staff, they are not very influential. And there, there are no significant differences between the compliers and non-compliers. But uh, it means that it's also uh, raised the question that we need to conduct more research after the COVID time because there are not, not sufficient visitors now. And for the control beliefs, the location of the multimedia information panels are the most important because it can be explained by that the people uh, are decided to interact or not with the panels by their location, the installation location. If it's easy to spot, they will tend to interact. If it's, they cannot even see it or there are too many people around it, they will reluctant to do it. And also the introduction of the panels and uh, user friendliness means the uh, hardware and software are easy to use are also contribute positively to the interaction. And also the user friendliness of the design of the interactive system and the instruction are also have the significant difference between compliance and non-compliance. So these two factors can be paid more attention to improve the visitor's experience and to encourage them to active more uh, actively with the interaction. So here we come to the conclusion and contribution. Um, definitely it provides a suggestion to how the Macomb Museum should design its interactive panels. First, it should provide new contents and uh, 
uh, the ways of interaction, because these two are the most important factors that decide people to uh, perform the interaction. And also, uh, the panels should be made easier for the visitor to use. They should have no time to uh, learn how to use it, but just when they see it, they have the instruction, it's easy to use, they will definitely use it. And also it has raised the question that we need more uh, studies after the COVID-19 time, especially on the others' visitors' influence on the, their interaction behavior. And the last one, it's applied the TPB theory under the context of museum visit management. So this theory has been utilized in the tourism study, but uh, not many heritage studies. So maybe it provides a possibility that uh, more heritage sites, not only museum, can use this series to improve its visitor management. So here it comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I would like to ask any expert panel members would like to ask questions. I think your presentation is quite interesting and uh, also um, um, not sure whether you will pass your presentation, you know, after you have done such um, sort, you know, um, size of uh, research can pass it to the IC for reference. I think this is quite of, um, from the view of a young generation to see, you know, how to, the museum is attractive to them or not. I think this kind of research, I, I don't know whether any college or from university have done this kind of similar research before. I think this is very good reference for the cultural um, department to at least to know what's the needs of the young generation, how they feel about the museums in Macau. I think this is uh, quite of um, interesting topics for, you know, for reference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's a very comprehensive research with a lot of data and it's quite connected. So I also very like the theory of planned behavior is really inspirational. And just to share with you like perspective from the Macau Museum, like previous years when we talked with them, because we are now also working with them on doing a kind of a training program for even younger generations, age of between 10 to 14. <laughs> so it's really an interesting perspective to see people from the age of 18 to 25 on multimedia panels in the Macau Museums. But before the COVID-19, what's the, the challenges from Macau Museum is always about, they have way too many visitors than they've expected. So uh, even though they do nothing, they've got a lot of people. And since they have limitations on the area, the space that they can use, and one of the major target audiences they serve is really tourists, not locals, meaning to say they don't feel the need to update their uh, exhibition content because there are just way too many Chinese visitors coming to Macau. So it served its purpose as Macau Museum. So they, I think it would be a very good reference for IC to plan because um, I think they also suggested that they need Macau needs another national museum or kind of local museum that serves local communities to introduce the history of the place or the, the background of this place in possibly the new reclaimed area. There's a need, I think it might possibly also be serving as a good reference for that. So my question would be, um, I just noticed that um, it's from the age of 18 to 25. So it would be whether they are tourists or, the, or they are locals, since majority of the visitors going to Macau Museums are visitors, not locals. Would there be any differences if it's serving locals or they are, they are visiting the Macau Museum? For sure, for most of the locals, these are not really new knowledge. So if it's take-ons from 
the locals, how do you feel about such differences on planning those interactive exhibition panels? Thank you. Well, actually, my study is focused on the locals. So they are all locals, not visitors. And uh, I think, uh, since I assume that most of the visitors have visited the Macomb Museum since they live here for a long time. So they are very familiar with the content and uh, it can uh, barely raise their interest. So I think it's, um, there is a need to, to, I think, to uh, provide new uh, excitement for the locals, to for them to enjoy. Because it's this place is more like uh, visitor attractions, not a heritage site for the old people, including locals. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I just have a one quick question about the, the findings. Uh, because I see the means with negative number, just typing or, or with meanings. Uh, the last last one, next. The typing, uh, next. Uh, this negative. Yeah, uh, the means are actually have the negative ones. And I will show you here on the, sorry, there's a typo. All right. On the third line, it's the cross border should be negative 18 to 18. All right, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our third presenter, Mr. Uh, Paul Lee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Li Xiu. Today, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you my research. The topic of it is the effectiveness of volunteer tourism as a heritage protection mode for non war heritage Fujian Tulu. And here is my presentation structures. I'd like to share with you some base, basic background information about Fujian Tulu. Uh, maybe some of you have watched a movie called Mulan, produced by Disney. And Mulan was actually lived in a round shaped building, and that was Tulo. And Fujian Tulo is a set of earthen architectures which created by the Hakka people uh, in the mountainous area of uh, Fujian province. And the earliest stage of constructions can date back to the 11th to 13th century. And it, since then, it has served as the defensive buildings for the communal living. As you can see here, um, um, the Fujian Tulo has been inscribed as World Heritage Sites in year 2008. And for the outstanding universal value, it highlights the commun communal living and their exceptional in terms of the size, building traditions and functions. And it also reflects the harmonious relationship with the environment. Whereas 40, 46 Tulos are inscribed in the World Heritage List, there are more than 20,000 Tulos are not receiving the um, official recognitions. It means they are under threats. And I will use our case studies of um, the World Heritage Volunteer 2019 campaign in my research. And this, uh, and this campaign took place in the mountainous area of Fujian province in the Dalingsha village, Longyan, as you can see from the map, Google Maps and the satellite map. Um, it reflects the actual situations of heritage conservations and the social development in the rural parts of China. So let's move on to the research introductions. Um, I have six research questions in total, one main questions plus five sub questions. They all together try to answer the questions uh, of the effectiveness of volunteer tourism as a heritage protection mode uh, for non war heritage Fujian Tulo. So my research um, conducted in an explanatory qualitative method. And as you can see from the right-hand side, the demographic profile of my, of my interview is, I used the semi-structure interview and I interviewed volunteers and the personnel from the volunteer sending organizations and also um, one university professors and a local business owner. So it allows me to 
uh, ask them the predetermined questions with some follow-up questions. And it also uh, enable my interviewee to share their thoughts and their uh, feelings on the current programs. So um, for, the, for the protection issues, uh, it can be separated into two, two scenarios. The first, steps, uh, the first types is abandoned to low. As shown in these pictures, some parts of Tulos are missing. Well, without people living in Tulo, well, Tulo will be very easy to collapse. Well, for the scenario of Tulo with its resident living inside, although the Tulo are uh, better maintained, but still the residents may renovate the Tulo in a haphazard manner. They will use the modern materials like the cement uh, bricks to build the structure. As you can see, they built a um, bathroom um, in front of the or original Tulo. So it will damage the original style and the appearance. So as for the challenges for the local community to address these issues, uh, I summarize as four. Uh, as you can see, the depopulations, insufficient awareness, and the desire for better living conditions, and the insufficient policies and the capital resources. They are not, inter they are not separated, but interrelated uh, they are interrelated factors. Um, for example, the insufficient awareness will contribute to the haphazard reuse, uh, haphazard usage of the new materials when the local residents want to turn their desire for a better living condition into the reality. And also, um, uh, as for the volunteer contributions to the challenges, um, I think uh, the main contributions are these three, the awareness and the psychological connections, economy effects and the heritage protections projects. Um, some interviewee states that the volunteer tourism may, have, may promote the Tulo to the outsiders. Moreover, some interviewees supports the social inclusions of marginalized people. In this, in this case, the left behind children can learn more about the outside world, while the elderly can have a kind of companionship. Volunteer tourism in the village increased the awareness of uh, local villagers in terms of uh, um, Tulo's cultural significance. Some interviewee believes that the volunteer tourism increased the incomes of uh, local villagers through two ways. One is through the volunteer tourism tourism activities conducted during the programs. Since I have uh, shared with you, um, the program was conducted in um, mountainous area and the Dalingxia village is actually a uh, agricultural based village. So the volunteers helps them to promote and sell the agricultural products to the outsiders like the prismant and the plum. The other types of contribution is uh, the, the direct spendings of the volunteers um, to to the local villages uh, to the local village uh, because they live in the the Tulo during the war camp. For the abandoned Tulo with residents, heritage protections uh, have slightly differences. Um, in terms of the abandoned Tulo, the first thing is to prevent them from collapsing. For while well, for the Tulo with residents, it is very important to conduct the heritage conservation projects uh, in align with the desire, the local villagers desire for a better living conditions. So one interviewee suggests that the volunteer tourist may involve it and contributes to the to those protection projects. Well, in terms of the current efficient eff effectiveness of the volunteer tourism programs in the in the village, um, interviewee as interviewee has different um, interviewee has two different ideas, and one idea points out that the volunteer tourism can hardly contribute to um, the challenge right now. Uh, the other idea supposed um, volunteer supports the volunteer tourism can actually benefit the Tulo and the villages. Well, some village. Some interviewee states that the drawbacks of volunteer tourism in terms of psychological connections 
with the local villagers. Well, in terms of the economy effects, some interview raised that um, the current um, the current volunteer programs are not so that efficient. So it can't bring too much economy effect to the local village. Conducting the heritage conserv uh, conducting the heritage conservations should uh, have some relevant capability. I noticed that we have uh, one architect here. So when when we want to uh, what we want to engage the volunteers into the heritage conservation projects. So they must have some knowledge in terms of um, architectural design and have some holistic, holistic viewpoint of um, heritage conservations. But one interview states that the person who joining the uh, current programs right now are not professionals. They are triggered by their hobbits. As for the entire programs, some interviewee believe that the current work camp, uh, the current work camp is not so so effectiveness in terms of bringing fundamental changes to the village and to the Tulo. Well, in terms of the overall effectiveness of volunteer tourism programs, one interviewee states that the program can only solve the problems in one situation, that is. Um, people have the motivation and also have the financial resources. Well, a good volunteer tourism mo pro, uh, model should have a long-term outlook and be managed sustainably. Well, it is very important to uh, empower the local uh, villagers into the heritage management process. And the volunteer tourism Having the volunteer tourism programs in the village does not automatically gain the concerns and the understandings for the local communities. Without their concerns and their supports, the heritage conservation projects, um, I think you can't make any progress. So additionally, knowing the needs from the perspective of a local community before impo imposing, that, um, imposing the changes may be uh, preferable. The relatively sh short term uh, war camps constrain the positive outcomes of the entire program. The duration is vital for deepening, uh, for deepening the both experience and impacts onto this place. And a per periodical continuous program may also improve the, the current war camp. Interviewee mentioned the roles of sending organizations to the entire programs, mainly from the aspect of program design. Moreover, in order to conduct a heritage conservation project, uh, as I have said just now, uh, volunteer selection process should be emphasized, should uh, based on uh, the candidates' uh, capabilities. After presenting the data that I collect, uh, I'm gonna share with you some, um, some uh, answers to my research questions. And they are organized in three sub things. The first one is the stagnancy is never the solutions. The current protection issues are the microcosm of some Chinese uh, cultural properties. Without official recognitions, without the status, uh, the heritage, heritage, uh, sorry, this heritage um, can hard, hardly receive any assistance from the authorities. So it is believed that the stagnancy is never the solutions for actively solving this, the seeds for planning process. Well, although the effectiveness of volunteer tourism should be evaluated uh, in the long term, it is believed that volunteer tourism can bring the village and those tools a possibility and a chance. The volunteer tourism program function as a catalyst for bringing under, underlying new positive changes and possibilities to the village in the Tulo. And under the circumstances of relatively low attention to the Tulo and the, from the either um, local community and the outsiders. But choosing the right and the high quality seat aligned with the villagers' situ, uh, situations. The future of the, uh, the future of the village and non-war heritage, non heritage Fujian Tulo protections can be flourishing. 
uh, lastly, um, the property alleviations and, re and the rural revitalizations um, of plenty of village in China, like Daling Shats, will, will not be a simple, easy issue. The reliance on the volunteer tourism as the single method to solve these problems may be dangerous. So the program is overloaded with too much uh, expectations. Uh, but introducing more models such as the, the investment mode and the uh, agricultural product mode. And these modes can have a synergent effect to uh, overcome the challenges and achieve the optimal outcomes of the protecting this non-war heritage tool. This paper discussed the interdisciplinarity of the tourism, social development, and the cultural heritage status studies to achieve the optimal, optimal outcomes um, in terms of the local uh, developments, heritage conservations, as well as the knowledge sharing and the reinforced community sense. At the same time, many, minimizing the potential negative impacts. The study reviews the current studies. Uh, the current volunteer tourism programs is conducive to the non-war hatch non-war heritage Fujian Tulo protections in raising the awareness, bringing the um, economy effects and conducting the direct heritage protection uh, projects. The current programs may, be, may not be so efficient in terms of addressing all the challenges. It is believed that the program can be further improved in the future and make it more efficient in achieving the optimal outcomes of protecting the non world heritage for gentle low. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now I would like to ask any expert panel members would like to ask any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fisher, congratulations on your presentation. Very interesting um, and the useful. The, the potential of this program to uh, help uh, the protection of um, far away uh, heritage. Uh, and and uh, I believe that maybe the last question that you pose, uh, how to further improve the effectiveness, uh, maybe it could uh, transition being from a volunteer tourism into on request or by invitation tourism, uh, further giving a, a stronger voice to the villagers themselves that they make a wish list of what they need. Uh, this one needs a plumber. This one needs to fix the window. This one needs an extra toilet. And then to find uh, in the program, find the right uh, profile of the tourists who can solve that uh, issue while having a pleasant uh, cultural tourism experience. So to have that uh, articulation of needs and uh, resources, uh, which is very uh, uh, interesting in your presentation for the potential that it can uh, create for protection of heritage. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. So any other questions from, from the panels? If no, how about the audience? Any questions? Yes. This was very interesting for me because the first presentation, we started with a very uh, specific case of uh, um, a forgotten uh, uh, heritage, the immovable aspect of the heritage that was being decayed. The second presentation of uh, um, Mr. Fisher, actually, uh, you're, you're Mr. Paul, sorry. <laughs> uh, the second presentation about the interpretation um, of uh, resources that can really um, make the promotion of the heritage values. And now this presentation about uh, resources and tools of how to um, articulate uh, um, aspects to improve the heritage and to uh, improve people's lives who live in that heritage, because we cannot force people uh, to uh, maintain the lifestyle of 100 years ago. We have to also provide the conditions that it, it is uh, fair to them. So this is a very comprehensive uh, three uh, pr uh, presentations. Thank you very much. So just one last question. Uh, among all those heritage sites we do have, why you choose Tolo as your um, research topic? Actually, it links to my personal experience. I personally participate in that work, uh, the work, work camp. So I was impressed by the kinds of Tolo's um, for its um, outstanding universal value and also 
they demonstrate the um, uh, good examples of communal living. So I was very impressed by the ram earth techniques that they used in um, building these structures. They didn't have the reinforcement concrete to build a such a big uh, architecture. I was I was so impressed by this architecture, and I think um, it would be helpful to um, conduct my research in this regard. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, almost finished already to the three presenters, and I think uh, this is a fruitful um, research outcomes probably they can share. And I can tell within just a year time, it's not easy for students somehow they can uh, do the quantitative and qualitative research all together. All right, uh, so now I would like to present a certificate to our student. Uh, the first one is Echo Hung. Huh? So I would like to present the uh, uh, token of appreciation for our expert panel members. And our next expert members, Ms. Nancy Hu. Thank you. Last. Okay, 
So now we have already finished our section and please enjoy your refreshment. Thank you.